Welcome back, everybody. I'm your host, Stephanie Michelle Swigert, a licensed and practicing SLP out of Los Angeles, California. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm here today with speechtherapypd.com. We are back for another episode this week, and we have an amazing and highly talented guest here with us today, Crystal Samford. Crystal, thank you so much for taking time to be here today to share your wisdom with all of us. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. It really is an honor to uh, be here today. Absolutely. And Crystal, we know you have your hands in so many things, so many impressive, wonderful things. I want to just rattle off a few of these for those who are listening to this episode. We know that you are the owner and director and lead advocate at the Sanford Autism Advocacy Group, LLC, since 2016. We know that you've been training autistic parents and caregivers on how to effectively advocate for the education of their children. And we know that you also, your first child was identified as autistic. We know that you've written various articles and some of those have been published through National Autism Foundations. You're the creator of, and I love this, I love the title, Crystal Clear IEP Course and the IEP Consultant Biz Builder Program, which are digital platforms, digital training platforms for parents and caregivers and professionals to expand their special education knowledge. And you're an SLP with over 20 years of experience in the public school and in the private sector. What are you involved in now? Did I miss anything? Uh, I wrote a little book, but that's that's just uh, one other little thing. That's, that's not little. Books. Tell us about that. <laughs> <laughs> that takes a lot to write a book. Um, well, it's and I and I always say that it is um, it's a, a small book with uh, filled with lots of hope. And so um, I wrote this book out of my own uh, journey and experience as an autist, a parent of an autistic child. And uh, coming uh, to find that diagnosis as well as my own health journey and with cancer and such things. So um, wow. the, yeah, the title of that book is uh, Sour Lemons and Prickly Pears, uh, Finding Good in Unexpected Places. Wow. We will, we'll put that in the resources at the end so everybody who is listening can um, get access to finding that book. Wow. Thank you for sharing that. And I love all the work that you are involved in and I'm excited to you're also my kind of gal because I read that um in your free time you love succulent gardening and curling up with good books and all of the hobbies that you find to do in your free time when you're not busy engaged in all of these activities so I'm excited to talk with you today we know that you are also an author of a course on speechtherapypd.com and this is called advocating for strength-based IEPs for autistic students so I want to dive into that for a little bit. Um, we know that the prevalence of autism is on the rise and that caseloads are continually growing for SLPs with students who um, all have their own unique strengths and challenges and personalities and interests. Mm -hmm. And we are moving as a whole collective group into this neurodiversity paradigm shift where we're looking at neurodiversity is human diversity. It's not something that needs to be fixed. And this movement really looks at seeing all people in terms of their unique functioning and their personal subjective experience. So this is why we wanna to talk to you today also. We know you are an expert on this, this, this shift of looking at students' strengths rather than focusing on deficits. And I think one of the challenges that we see in our profession is we want to, as a helping professional, we want to ensure that our clients are getting the absolute best education possible. They're getting access to the best and most appropriate services for them, that the practices are non-harming, that the environment is inclusive. So knowing that you are an expert on this topic, the golden question we really have for you today, Crystal, is if you could share with us, what would be three key components that speech clinicians should consider when writing an IEP for their autistic student? Wow, what a, what a big question, uh, but uh, a really meaningful one, especially in the times that we live in when we are making such a shift, right? So um, starting with that idea in mind that we are looking at student strengths, 
uh, that we are considering where the child is and we're being honest, right? And, and, and a lot of the research that I've read um, talks about, we're not denying that children with, who are autistic have uh, a unique uh, profile, um, but we are honoring that and recognizing where they are now, what are those starting points and how can we help them move kind of along that continuum into where, you know, we want them to be. Um, and so there are several things, and we talk about this in the, in the class uh, that I taught, uh, but the first one is integrating person-centered planning into your IEP and into that process. And um, a lot of, you know, what I promote and what I've learned comes from my work in uh, the secondary field when I was a speech pathologist, four years in high school and uh, 10 years in middle school. And in high school, it is a requirement. And, and in the, looking at the law by at age 16, it is a requirement to add a transition plan to a child's IEP. And right. so, you know, at that point, we're forced to, for lack of a better word, um, talk with the student about their interests and strengths and where do they want to go in adulthood. And the IEP has to have goals that are helping to draw dri driven by that and helping them to get to where they ultimately want to be by adulthood. Right. And, you know, I always felt like that was great. Why don't we do that for all of our kids? Um, and so even as early as, you know, preschool, uh, all the way up through, you know, 21, where the IEP continues, um, thinking about who is the child? What are their interests? What are their strengths? What drives them? What motivates them? Uh, ultimately, where do they want to be? And so that's going to require some person-centered planning, maybe um, for a child who, who is, you know, speaking or um, who has that capacity, you can ask them, you can do some questionnaires, you know, you can, uh, you know, people ask, well, how do you do that, you know, for a three-year-old? Well, you know, you can even starting there, you can talk with them about and talk with their families about, you know, okay. what are the interests and strengths and such. Um, even for kids who are non-speaking, maybe who have uh, higher needs, you can use their communication device. They can maybe even use eye gaze, whatever it takes to kind of get a glimpse of who they are as a person and, and what makes them tick, because that's where you're going to get the greatest amount of um, motivation and uh, buy-in so that they are an active participant in their IEP. Yes, and I like how you said you can talk to their family members, you can talk to other people as well to gain that information. Yeah, yeah, yeah yes. for sure. Yeah, I think that's important. And we do that, you know, I always think about like kind of where, where we are, and what, what do we focus on? We do a lot of that in preschool, right? Early intervention, uh, so much of it is family training, parent training, and bringing in the family unit. Um, but in, in a class that I took years ago, I remember the professor saying, it ends once they're out of preschool. And then from elementary on, uh, we don't involve the families as much. And, and I feel like we should, mm -hmm. uh, you know, especially in our kiddos who have more needs so that we can uh, begin to integrate the family and integrate some of the things that we're doing so that we're gonna see the most uh, progress and generalization. Very end. Yeah, yeah. So another thing to consider are um, the conditions of, um, the environment for the child. Okay. Um, so, you know, as you're writing IEPs, you might think about, um, you know, goals, um, but what are the conditions that really help support the child? Maybe they do best uh, early in the morning. So maybe you're considering that your speech sessions, if possible, you can provide them in the morning time. Or maybe it's a child who um, is really struggling, but they do really well if they have a lovey with them or a stuffed animal. So maybe you're considering that something that you're going to bring in. Um, or maybe it is uh, a modified schedule. Maybe it's a kiddo who just uh, for sensory reasons can't be at school all day, right? So um, maybe it is that they come to school in the middle of the day. So they, they miss the chaos of the morning and the chaos of the drop-off but they're there in those critical moments in the middle of the day, and that's when you can best support them. So thinking about the conditions that really best support the child, um, that again can, can help us make a more meaningful progress. I love that. And I'm flashing back to a student that I worked with that loved having their blanket 
mm -hmm. with them and that blanket they were, felt really supported by that and would always come to speech with that blanket so i love that thinking about the conditions so thinking about the time of day thinking and you got me thinking about okay now my brain's going to are the lights too bright or just some of the yeah. the things that we can adjust mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. for sure yeah and in the class we talk about that like i put out a lot of examples and then we have some time to talk about what is this making you think about? What are some things that you, you know, you, you know, you're amazing people. SLPs were, you know, you have very creative kinds of brains typically, right? So, so what are those things that are coming to your mind? So that's great. That's a totally another one is uh, the lights. Mm -hmm. Oh, and uh, anything that, that might be specific to, to your student, what might work, what conditions might support. So. And again, we can get that information also, not just from the student, but from their families, or we can talk with the teachers to see what's working, what's not working and yeah. come up with a plan through that collaboration. Exactly. Yeah. You just, you never know. And it, and it, and, you know, the old African proverb, it takes a village and it really does um, <laughs> in this case as well, you know, and why, why reinvent the wheel? If somebody is finding something that works, that's, that's fine. And just integrate it as a part of the IEP. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so the third point is uh, really, and this is something I, uh, we are just kind of talking about uh, on a regular basis and in my company as well, is being objective, being objective with the information that you share and trying not to add that, um, uh, the anecdotal piece or the more subjective piece that can be, you know, possibly misconstrued, unfortunately, right? So um, it's being able to state that a child um, engages in a behavior versus a child is mean or naughty or, you know, uh, something else that, that, you know, could be taken wrong by a parent or by a teacher or by someone else who might pick up that IEP. Um, and so just really being matter of fact and stating the facts. And, and uh, you know, we talk about examples like, um, you know, the student may uh, glance when engaged uh, in conversation versus the student can't keep eye contact, you know. Mm -hmm just really explaining it. I mean, I think that's going to be really supportive for families too, so they can really understand what you mean by what you're saying. Uh, yeah. I like that because you're saying what the child can do versus what the child can't do. I'm also hearing you say that when we're stating observations, maybe removing our evaluations from it. Yes. Um, sure. So taking out our opinions on it and just um, looking at it from a clinical standpoint, and we're focusing on the strengths. And this this reminds me of a point that I heard that um, really stuck. Instead of saying things like, um, "Oh, the child is just obsessed with and is is too fixated on," you could say the child is very excited about you know whatever the toy is or something that they're looking at. So it's looking at how to reframe our language and I really appreciate that and I'm I'm enjoying learning about ways that I can shift my own language um, from all of these years oh, in yeah. speech where I wasn't taught this and now seeing the shift of how you know the language that we can use I'm really excited about it and I'm really excited about everything that you're sharing today I oh, think wow. um, it's very important information thank you yeah. um, there is a phrase that uh, is shifting as well but the original phrase was nothing about us, nothing about us without us. Um, and so thinking about as we're developing IEPs, as we're developing programs, as we're trying to support autistic students, have we involved them in the mm. process? Have we honored them in the process? Have we even asked them? You know, I, you know, I have uh, parents who will say, well, you know, I'm not sure about this or that. And, and my first question is, have you asked your child if they like that? Have you asked your child if that interests them or not? Maybe you might be surprised by what the information that you find out. And so I feel like the shift that we're making is really helping to involve the client. So we're not just doing, you know, speech at them or services at them, but along with them. And again, that's where we're going to see those long lasting results. And that's that relationship building too, yeah. right? Because yeah. you're really considering their needs. Not, so let's say that again, nothing about us without us. Yes. yes. I love that. That's yeah. Where did that come from? Oh my gosh. That came from work out of South Africa in looking at uh, diversity and inclusion. I want to say it 90s or 2000s. Um, but now from what I've heard, they're kind of shifting that and just saying nothing without us. How about nothing, not just services, not just, that, but anything that's happening in the world, how about include us as well? Uh, that's a great mantra, a great reminder. Yeah, for yes, sure. Absolutely. 
Well, this, these are powerful takeaways. Um, Crystal, thank you so much. We know you are highly involved in the autistic community. You're serving clinicians and, and families and um, your, your clients and your own um, child. Do you have more than one child? I have two kiddos. I have uh, two girls and uh, 10 and 12 at this point. My oldest is uh, the one on the spectrum. My other one has an IEP with other needs, but yeah, two girls. So they alone keep me busy. You're uh, very busy. <laughs> and you wrote a book. This is amazing. <laughs> yeah. I swear, I, I meet some of the most incredible SLPs who have so many hats and are involved in so many projects and are just so passionate about what they're they're sharing and what they're doing that it doesn't even feel like work. When I mean, it can feel like work, I guess, but when you just get so excited and passionate about um, serving the world in this way, it's just, it's such a joy. So, and I, I can I just say, I love how you came up with crystal clear IEP. I went to the, I went to the website and checked that out. I love that. And I love how you were able to trademark and incorporate your name into that. So that's a lot of, a lot of fun. So let's talk about that. You have some resources out there. If people want to find out more information about you, whether they're clinicians, whether they're um, parents of autistic children, anybody who wants to um, get the information that you have to share, where can they find out more about you, Crystal? Yes, so I try to house as much as possible on our website, um, and okay. so our main website is sdautismhelp.com. Uh, we're based out of San Diego, but we support families all across the world, really, um, and so there's resources there on our resource page. There's links to the book, links to the courses that we have. Uh, the, like you mentioned, the IEP uh, Biz Builder program is for clinicians who uh, might want to consider adding, especially if you're in private practice, um, adding a bit of advocacy into the work that you do with clients. So that program is there. Uh, the conference, Yeah, you know, uh, lot, lots of different resources. So they're all on the website. And I love that you, they're, they're digital courses. So are they self-paced where if you get the course, you can kind of work through it at, at your own pace in your schedule? Yes. So uh, the Crystal Clear IEP conference, uh, I teach live once monthly, um, but the, the other course, I have created a version that is self-paced. And so that online course, you can download it. You have uh, unlimited access to it and you can just move at it at your own pace. Crystal, thank you so much for being here with us. For everybody that's listening, um, April is Autism Acceptance Month. So we really encourage our listeners to, to celebrate this month. And some of the ways that you can do so are maybe raising awareness by wearing the color blue. You can light it up blue. You can read books or listen to podcasts that have autistic contributors. You can search for autistic people. You can go onto Google or on the internet, such as artists and inventors and directors. You can learn more about the neurodiversity affirming language and the paradigm shift. You can support businesses owned by autistic people or businesses that employ um, autistic employees and just spread awareness and kindness and any knowledge that you have in your own local area, in your own neighborhoods. And you can also take a deeper dive into this topic on speechtherapypd.com to further your education. You can check out Crystal Sanford's course, Advocating for Strength-Based IEPs for Autistic Students. And again, it's on speechtherapypd.com. For other topics, when you subscribe to speechtherapypd.com, you're going to get one year access to over 800 live and on-demand courses where you can scoop up those ASHA CEUs. If you're new to speechtherapypd.com, you can access a free course. So make sure you see the information below this episode and find out how you can access that. We will be back here next week answering more of those golden questions that SLPs and SLPAs are asking and we're bringing in more of the industry leading experts like Crystal to give you the answers that you need. If you liked this episode, give it a thumbs up. We also want to hear from you. So feel free to comment in the comment section below or ask a question if you have a question for us. And you can also find all of the links to the resources that we talked about today below this episode. We'll see you all here next week. Take care, everybody.